Chapter 22 The Souls of Sailors Boney was a warrior, away a ya. A warrior ran a terrier, John Francois. Short drag shanty. Get out and stay out, you miserable sausage. Over the sill of the galley doorway leapt an active young pig. The firm tattoo of Joe Bloom's wooden leg on its rump punctuated the porker's squeals of disillusionment and humbled pride. Bert jumped aside just in time to avoid being swept off his feet. Look out, sir. I'll get him. Barney threw himself headlong at the fleeing pig and clamped his arms tightly about its middle. In close embrace, they rolled over twice before they brought up in the scuppers. Ride him, cowboy, encouraged a seaman. Bueno, vaquero, esta bueno, a Mexican shouted. Bent nearly double with laughter, Bert watched the writhing mass in the scuppers resolve itself into a triumphant Barney and a conquered but protesting pig. This is the worst one of the lot, sir, the hogman panted. I can't keep him in that new pen, no ways. He can go right through a crack no wider than your fist. But it wouldn't do no good to close it up, sir, because he'd jump right over the top. Barney got to his feet and started forward, gripping his charge tightly by one ear and its little twisted tail. Bert walked beside him. The cup of coffee for which he had come to the galley could wait. When they reached the pen under the forecastle head, Barney picked the renegade up bodily and heaved him over the side. How about another board around the top of the pen? Bert suggested. Wouldn't that keep him in after this crack was nailed up? Barney's eyes glowed with admiration. He fixed one eye on the boy while the other stared at the bosun's locker to his right. Well now, sir, that's a good idea. It sure is. If I could just find some more boards, I might try that. But he'd get out anyhow, sir. He'd get out somehow. That there pig is just like I was when I was a young man, sir. Wild I was. A regular young devil. Always out looking for excitement and always getting into trouble. Just like this here pig. Bert nodded gravely. I'll bet you were a bad one, all right, Barney, he said, and the hogman acknowledged the compliment with a sly grin. But tell me, Bert went on, how are you getting along with the China gang? Fine, sir, fine. They're always wanting a bit of a dance. Have you ever seen me clog? Charlie la Lee. Some folks would say I was getting old, but my feet are still good. La la Lee la. But what about that trip to the South Seas, Barney? Have they given that up? The hogman put his bristled face close to the boys and lowered his voice to a hoarse whisper. Oh, no, sir. We're going to turn back any time now. But I'll tell you, there's something I don't like about this. I do my job no matter who, Skipper, and my job is taking care of these here rambunctious hogs. But these fellas that are going to run the ship after we turn back, they want to make me chief mate. Now, that don't look like no good sense, does it? You know. I think I'd rather work for a skipper that knows the difference between a hog man and a mate. Me, I'm a hog man, and a good one if I do say it. But, Lord, sir, I couldn't be a mate. I wouldn't know what to do. And who are... Bert stopped. Two Mexicans were drawn close. Did they understand English? Had they heard? It might endanger Barney's life if the gang knew that the simple-minded hog man had a confidant in the crew... Certainly, it would prevent him from getting any further information to confide. Quickly, Bert altered his question. And how are you going to keep that pig in now that you've got him there? He asked. Fortunately, it was not difficult to change Barney's tack. That wild one, you mean? He answered. Well, just between I and you, sir, I don't believe I can keep that pig in. I think I'll be chasing that pig all the rest of this voyage unless Cook takes a cleaver to him. Bert walked away making some laughing remark to the hogman over his shoulder and bumped squarely into Fong Tuck. Huh? grunted the Chinese, examining the chopsticks and empty bowl in his hands to see if they had been damaged by the collision. Hello, Fong Tuck, the boy greeted him. I'm sorry I ran into you, but I'm glad to see you. Huh? The old yellow man repeated, I's no good. Maybe so he is no good, too. All time you look-see. Bert grinned cheerfully but there was not an answering flicker on the impassive face of the Chinese. I'm seeing a lot, Tuck, and hearing a lot, too, the boy told him, though I'll admit I wasn't very observant just then. Can do, Fong Tuck acknowledged. By and by, you see plenty. 
Maybe so you stay on behind boat. Trouble come, you in good place. With that, he turned his back and shuffled off to the Chinese galley to fill his bowl with steaming rice. Accepting his dismissal, Bert started to stroll aft, then swung on his heel and climbed the ladder to the forecastle head instead. A favorite loafing spot for the tween deckers in warm weather, the exposed forecastle head was usually deserted now, which made it a good place for a moment's solitude. Bert wanted to be alone, to think. Trouble was coming. Of that he had not the slightest doubt. It had been brewing for a long time, and only the gang's terror of the storm and, later, their respect for the forts on Oahu and the deadly speed of the gray destroyers had prevented its breaking sooner. It was not likely that a third chance circumstance would interfere with mutiny. Now trouble seemed to be in the very air. First there was his own intuition, if that were to be trusted. Then there was the hog man's remark. We're going to turn back any time now. And lastly, there was the plain statement of the hatchet man that trouble come soon. Did Captain Hagestrom, too, have wind of the impending crisis? Perhaps he had better go aft and tell the captain the little that he knew. Overhead, a patch of blue opened in the heavy clouds and the sun sent a small ray of warmth through the chill air. Yes, he would go aft and talk with the captain, but first it would be pleasant to stretch out on the bowsprit and watch the still water beneath. The wind had fallen light that morning so that the bark's cut water sliced quietly through the dull sea at less than five knots, perhaps only four. Great orange-colored jellyfish lay pulsating slowly until the vessel's slight bow wake rolled them aside. Dark forms darted quickly away as the advancing forefoot bore down on them. The bowsprit rose and fell rhythmically over the low seas, there was something almost hypnotizing about the monotonous motion and the soft swoosh of the cutwater. He would talk to the captain. There were guns now, many guns, for the box had been heavy. A few shots, or perhaps just the sight of the guns. Suddenly, Bert became aware that someone was near him. No, that was impossible, since he was lying on the bowsprit 20 feet from the night heads. He turned his head to look. In the same instant, his right arm was doubled behind him, and his right foot was cruelly twisted. He knew instinctively that he could not resist a twisting force on arm and leg, but to give in to it meant to roll off the bowsprit. From somewhere out of his past training there flashed the phrase, Use your opponent's strength. And in the same fraction of a second, his decision was made and acted on. Like a wrestler, he spun his body to the left, kicking violently with his free foot. It struck flesh and instantly his other foot was released. His left arm darted under his body and circled the man's leg as he turned. The unexpected movement and a quick wrench freed his right arm. He grabbed again, and in doing so, glimpsed the distorted, grimacing face of Dopey Jay above him. Perhaps he could throw his attacker over him and recover himself by the impetus of his throw. He put all his strength into the effort, an effort that carried him clear over the side of the bowsprit. One groping hand found a wire stay and tore loose. He was falling, falling, with the arm of Dopey J clamped tightly about his neck. He gasped his lungs full of air. The daylight was blotted out. He was momentarily paralyzed by the shock of the cold water. Then a red steel wall bore down on him. He got his feet against it and kicked, kicked with all his might. It seemed to follow his feet, and he kicked again. Now it began slipping by without coming closer. The boy longed for air, but the struggling man, who clung about his neck, held him down. Without attempting to swim, Bert brought one knee up to the man's stomach and ducked his head quickly and pushed. The arms slipped from his head. He was free. Desperately, he fought to reach the surface to find relief for his bursting lungs. His head broke water, and he gasped in half a dozen breaths before he trusted himself to drop below the surface and swim out of his heavy jacket and push off his scuffers. Lucky he wasn't wearing boots, he thought. Again, he breathed and looked around for the grimacing hophead. He was nowhere in sight. Still, the interminable steel wall slid past, a wall that changed from red to black a foot or two above the water. He must attract attention. He shouted once, but already the bulwarks along the main deck had passed and the high poop rose above him. Now the perpendicular side of the vessel became an overhanging wall and receded toward the rudder. He shouted again. There was no answer. He stopped treading water 
and began to swim, but slowly as the bark was moving, he knew that the race would be brief if he wasted his energy trying to keep up with it. Then he remembered the log line. Turning quickly, he swam into the vessel's wake, sighted the slender white line where it sagged into the water twenty yards astern, and made for it with all his speed. He reached it, grasped it, and in the instant that his hand closed over the line, something struck him in a stinging blow in the face. He looked up, saw a swift shadow descending toward his head, and ducked. A sharp blow fell on the back of his head, and powerful wings beat about his face. Goonies, the souls of drowned sailors. With horror, he remembered the stories the seamen had told about them. He had doubted the stories. Now he believed them. The big brown albatrosses wanted his eyes. Towing through the water by the hand, which gripped the log line, he fought the birds with the other hand until it was torn and bleeding. He remembered his clasp knife and turned his face underwater while he fished the knife out of his pocket and opened it with his teeth. He flashed the knife upward through the water at a swimming bird, and the blade sank into flesh. He lifted his face to breathe, keeping his arm across it for protection, and struck out at the nearest flyer. A wing crumpled, and the bird dropped sideways into the water with a horrible, raucous scream. Bird struck again and again, but still the brown forms hurtled against his head. His face was underwater more than it was above now, and his strength was going. He breathed in great, sobbing gasps. He felt the log line slipping through his hand. Slipping, slipping. What did it matter? But still he fought, fought desperately for his eyes, for his life. Gradually, a thought took shape in his mind. Why hadn't he acted on it sooner? Underwater, the birds could not reach him. How simple to stay underwater and escape from the merciless beaks. It was pleasant down there, too, and strangely warm. And somewhere there was beautiful music, faint as though it came from a great distance. In the hand that held the log line, the boy felt a piece of metal, round, with flat fins, sticking out from its metal barrel. Something tugged at it, and he let it go. It was pleasant here, very pleasant. Sleep. Sleep. Now he would sleep.